thank you. Okay, very good. Well, thanks very much for uh, having me on. It's a pleasure to be here talking to you all. So um, I'm going to talk a bit, as uh, Liz has just introduced, about um, sensors for water. Um, now, they do, at the moment, the company is selling uh, sensors for nutrients and also pH, um, but through the NOC and the University of Southampton, we've developed a very large number of different water sensors. So if there's uh, something particular uh, that I don't talk about today that you want to measure, do get in touch. Um, that's one of the most enjoyable bits is um, talking to stakeholders who want to measure something that currently can't be measured well and solving that problem uh, for them. So um, I'm, I'm a, I have dual roles, so I am a, now a PI at the Oceanography Centre um, in, in Southampton. Um, I'm an honorary professor at the University of Southampton, and I'm also the CTO and director of a, of a new company, Clearwater Sensors Limited, which is where you see all the branding uh, for, for this presentation, um, which is very exciting. Uh, having been in academia for a while and then uh, going into into industry really interesting lots of uh, tales to tell so if anybody's fancying having a go at that then please also do get in contact um hopefully this is a bit of a success story for for NERC um this has been going on a while <laughs> so the idea for uh doing work in this area first happened around 2002 when I joined the NOC after my after my PhD um, and NERC and NOC did a lot of pump priming around that. We did a few early small grants uh, for a few years and really proved the concept. I guess the first thing that I, I was concerned wouldn't work was putting micro sensors and microfluidics into natural systems, into natural waters. I thought things would grow on them and they'd never work, but actually that hasn't proven to be true right from the beginning, even without very much biofouling protection. And so with, with some initial results under our belt, um, EPSRC and NERC worked together and co-funded uh, the Ruggedized Microsystems Technology Grant back in 2000. And, well, the grant was written in 2005, I think, but 2007, we really started in earnest. Um, and that was 2.2 million, it's quite a big investment. 70% um, NERC, 30%, sorry, 70% EPSRC, 30% NERC. Um, and there's been a number of big programs, including Oceans 2025, that have followed on since. Um, and we've been getting good results and, uh, and the, the whole thing has grown really nicely. We started looking at commercialization when we had functional systems in 2011. Um, so it gives you an idea about some of the challenges associated with commercialization. The startup uh, with the license um, was operational. So 2019, actually, we started selling first units uh, last year, at the end of last year. Um, so it hasn't all been NERC. NERC have funded this to the tune of around £10 million. Um, there's been a lot of other funding. Actually, the European Union has been really important, especially because they typically fund at high technology readiness levels. And in that pre-commercialization speech, where you've got some uh, piece where you've got something working, uh, but it needs to be taken through. Um, still getting European Union funding at the moment, um, and, and I think we'll have to think about what's going to happen if, if that doesn't continue. Uh, but at the moment, it certainly seems to be stable, and we've got a few more grants. Uh, we've also had EPSRC funding, as I said, uh, a couple of grants, the Ruggedized Microsystems Technology Grant and the Mission Grant. We've also worked with BBSRC on things like detecting pathogens um, for shell fisheries, harmful algal blooms, and the like. Okay, so you know, there's a lot of money been spent. A lot of people have worked on this for many years. What's the result? Well, we have um, commercialized. So we have a, a list of about 20 different um, measurement technologies that can be deployed from environments, including subglacial lakes, all the way up to um, you know, the energetic surface ocean. Um, but what's been commercialized is this technology, which is um, lab on a chip uh, or microfluidic technology to produce analyzers that use reagents to analyze water. Um, that's important because it gives very high quality uh, measurements, very similar to the laboratory, high quality laboratory measurements that people uh, run on samples. Um, and this technology is quite mature because of the length of time that, and the number of people that have worked on this. We've done over 200 deployments, learnt from over 200 deployments. There's been a lot of iterative development. Um, 90 journal publications, some of these devices have been out for over a year, 
for example, one under the uh, under the ice in the Arctic. Um, they're very robust, 6,000 meter depth rated, which is uh, you know world best. They also have world leading uh, metrology performance in, ter uh, in terms of sensitivity and accuracy, um, and they've been proven all over the all over the globe. Um, why, why are we doing this? Well, uh, many of you will know, but water chemistry is, is really central to understanding many aspects of our natural environment in uh, mitigating and managing climate change and environment, environmental degradation, but also um, for issues such as water supply and food uh, generation and, and industry. Um, so there's, there's a number of drivers why this information is needed. And I think that's perhaps a, a space where um, I am, and as a technologist, keen to work with the NERC community to really understand how we can make best use of that and make impact in these, these various application uh, areas. Um, and why did we focus on uh, nutrients and the carbonate system to start with? Well, it's, you know, the nutrients and carbonate system are central to most of the state of the art. Um, biogeochemical and ecological system models in, in oceans and in catchments and river system, systems, um, and they were poorly measured. Uh, there's a lot of variability uh, in, in those parameters, and doing a grab sample once a week doesn't really catch that. You know, there's tidal and uh, storm-driven variations, and of course the biology comes to play, so there's massive variation as biology comes to play. Um, so that's where we focused our efforts because there was a technology gap and they were very important. And really, the nutrients, the carbon system drives all of this uh, activity in, in aqueous environments. Um, as it happens, measuring those things then enables you to support a number of other applications, including uh, you know, the, the sustainable development goals in, in various tiers, because you know, directly you can see how measuring water chemistry feeds into clean water and sanitation and life below water. But you know, through supporting another bunch of uh, sustainable development goals, you can see how you also have impacts on good health, gender equality, and um, of work and economic growth, for example. Um, so that's that's become apparent. It wasn't our initial driver, but that's that's um, certainly where we've um, where we've landed. Um, in terms of the ocean space, which is where we started. Um, you can see that the international community has also agreed that these are, are important. So this is in order of priority, and this is in terms of what the uh, ocean uh, community really wants to measure. Oxygen is right at the top, and then it's nutrients and inorganic carbon, and, and that's exactly why we, we started measuring in, in that order. Now, I've, uh, I've listened uh, and greatly enjoyed some of the other uh, webinars that have been given by the the Constructing Digital Environment uh, series. And uh, I was really struck actually by a couple, um, one by Prof Savage on law of averages, exactly what we see. Uh, you know, a lot of um, parameterizations and understanding is based on averages. Uh, and that isn't very good because there's a lot of variability in the system. So that means that most of the time, actually, those simple models based on averages are actually wrong and, and they need more data to be able to constrain the variability and the nonlinearity in the systems. And, uh, and that's where uh, measurements uh, have value. It's also a nonlinear system. The cost functions are nonlinear. So, you know, things like fines for regulatory exceeding is a, you know, a step function or a Delta Dirac function. Um, it, you can stock health in aquaculture is the same deal. You know, if you can, everything looks fine and then you have a harmful algal bloom and uh, you can lose a lot of stock and a lot of value. I mean, a sing single incident can uh, be up in the sort of hundreds of millions uh, of dollars for some, some companies. And so, uh, you know, the potential benefits of understanding water quality uh, is an economic driver as well as a, an environmental driver. Um, the interventions equally are costly. So, uh, you know, cessation of activity or uh, doing remediation is also very expensive, which means it's, it's often worth making the measurements. However, people don't make the measurements because of the logistical and um, uh, challenges with current, current systems. And that's hopefully where our technology can come to play. And we've done this a couple of times. So um, we've looked at both the decreasing the cost of getting your data. So actually by investing in, in some technology, you can decrease the cost of getting the data you're already getting. So we've looked at this with 
people like CEH and the Environment Agency. Um, but also it can give you a lot more value because you get more better data than you would um, get uh, by, by doing sampling alone or not measuring and, and relying on proxies or inferred models. So that's, I think that's the space where we're very keen to talk to, uh, to people to try and uh, develop those numbers and, and some of the, uh, the theory around that, but, but certainly our initial work certainly shows that it's, it's worth measuring and the data is, is valuable in, in that space. So current methods um, in a number of environments, deep sea to rivers uh, to tanks, uh, you know, we're all taking manual samples, which is, is, is OK, um, but it has relatively low temporal res resolution. And actually, when you work out the per sample cost is expensive compared to other me methods. Um, and because it requires lab analysis, you can have storage and preservation problems. Um, there are some auto samplers which give you, you know, slightly higher resolution. Um, but it, again, it still requires lab analysis and uh, preservation can still be an issue. Um, online analyzers have really made an impact, particularly in um, things like the water industry, and they're high resolution. They're, they're, they're generally like sensors, but the infrastructure required means that you've got to have significant investment. You need to build a shared and supply mains power and typically Ethernet, and somebody needs to go and maintain, uh, maintain them. And that and moving those around a catchment, for example, is really prohibitive. And so you only get data from a very few locations. In contrast, you know, having an in situ sensor, you can get very high resolution data. And because you haven't got the infrastructure, you can move that around uh, the catchment and you can have many more of those systems um, turning out, turning out the data. OK, so that's why we've gone into this technology. So the technology is is in situ, so it can it can go into the environment submerged um, based on a chemical analysis based on uh, microfluids. You get really frequent measurements with uh, you know, lab grade or better, as you'll see in a minute, uh, measurements, which really improves the data in your you know, control, compliance and understanding of the environment. Um, They've got a long lifetime and they're automated, which means that the actual cost per measurement comes down dramatically. And we, we see at least an order of magnitude, sometimes two or three orders of magnitude um, savings in cost per sample. Um, and because they're very robust, you know, they can they can go in a number of environments. And as I've said, we've done this a lot, right? We've learned a lot from over 200 deployments. Here's some um, figures of uh, performance of merit. Um, I'm not gonna go through these in detail, but you know, it's, it's low, low energy. So you can have, you know, several thousand measurements um, from a battery um, and the limits of detection and precision are actually better than you'll get in a standard uh, scalar or you know, lab grade um, analyzer for these for these parameters. So it's, you know, the results are very good. Um, one of the ways in which we do that is we have onboard standards, so uh, you will have a preserved standard. Uh, on or two on board plus a blank, and that enables in situ calibration, it gives you really good, um, really good results. There's a user swappable reagent canister, which means that they're relatively easy to use. You don't need an analytical chemist to turn these things around and recharge them. It's a bit like plugging in a new printer cartridge. Um, uh, you know, typically 2,000 measurements per canister, but we can do bigger ones if people want to go longer. It has quite an onboard, uh, quite a sophisticated onboard microcontroller, uh, which means that you know the uh, the digital part of the digital environment can interact with this very well. There's an RS232 interface, which in it, which we've plugged into modems, which enables this to go wireless and get connected to to the internet, e.g. with a with a GSM modem or a Iridium modem. And we've got solutions for, for that data then to flow either into data centers or to the cloud or to um, uh, organizations bespoke data systems with all the good things like uh, labeling, metadata, uh, traceability of, of parts and of calibration so that that data can, uh, can, can be of the best standard. Um, a little bit of under the bonnet, because uh, I, I know a lot of people like to look under the bonnet of things. What's inside the sensors? Well, there's, this is a kind of schematic here on the left of, uh, of uh, what's inside the device. Um, broadly, there's a network of channels connected to the reagents, the environment, and the standards and blanks, um, and some syringe pumps. 
So actually, it's a very high precision syringe pump. So to move, uh, you know, a few microliters of fluid around a piece of plastic, you actually need a very precise and coordinated set of pumps. And so we do that with this. Uh, we have a syringe pump that uh, has many barrels all connected to a single plate, which means they all drive at exactly the same rate and you don't get any differential dilution problems. Um, and then we have optical cells. So we can measure um, fluorescence, luminescence or absorbance, but actually all of the ones that are commercially available at the moment measure absorbance. And that is done with, uh, with optics. Um, I'll show that coming up to another slide in a minute to show that a bit more in detail. Um, but the electron, you can see the, the structure of the device on the, uh, on the right hand side, you can see the little, on the bottom there's some um, channels there cut in a piece of plastic, that's what it looks like before we stick the lid on. In the middle is um, how we polish up those channels to get them smooth with, with some solvent polishing um, so that the, everything operates as it will, it, it should, nothing gets stuck in it, the optical performance is very good. And then you can see the electronics in the top right there. Um, the chip is the black piece of plastic. It's actually on a stand in that image in the top right. Um, the, the, the chip with the fluidics in it is actually at the base of that unit um, and the electronics are stuck onto the top of it and the valves are stuck on the top and the pump stuck on the top and that forms the inside of a pressure case. Um, so the, the end plate of the pressure case is actually the microfluidic chip and inside the pressure case is all the electronics and what have you. We protect that from the water by filling it with oil and that means that the pressure could communicate into that um, side of the of the device and that's where we get our very high pressure tolerance. It does mean all of our electronics are running at ambient uh, pressure. Okay, so under the bonnet a bit more, um, the, one of the key things is the optics. So we have a patent um, describing how we use uh, tinted or dark materials um, to suppress the stray and scattered light you'd otherwise get measuring absorbance in a microchannel in a clear plastic. You can see that in the top image. There's light bouncing around all, all over the place. Um, and I think I, I can do this. Can you see my mouse if I do that? Yeah, okay. So you can see in the top image, there is, there's, a, there's light all over. This is where the detector would sit. And there's light all over that. And that's come from the LED, bounced around the device. Um, and there's a very large illumination spot, and most of that hasn't been through the fluid. And that's what a lot of systems do, and they just measure the, try and blank off some of that and then measure uh, as best they can the, the light that's been through the liquid. If you make it in a darker uh, or tinted um, material, you get this lovely little tiny spot of light that's only gone through the liquid. Um, and that's what really enables us to make some really high performance measurements. And the nice thing about that is there's no optics, you know, no lenses, no expensive bits involved. And we can make multiple measurement cells of different lengths to give you very high dynamic range. So actually our nitrate analyzer has got the highest dynamic range in the business. We can measure up to the millimolar with a very short channel. And on the same device, we've got some long channels that mean we get that very, very low uh, limit detection. And if people want to go lower, we can make longer channels. Uh, so do talk to us if that's something you're, you're interested in. Um, okay. Uh, so we spent a lot of time um, on some of the value that you're getting is around assay optimization. Um, really important that, to say that you can't just apply uh, assays off the bench in an in-situ device. And so we've done a lot of work on that, looking at things like interferences, the chemistry, the uh, salinity effects, um, I'm not going to go through all of the detail on that slide, but, but it's been very important to fit the assay to the device and to the application and to the, to the sample that you're working with. Um, and that's one of the ways in which we, we get very good performance. Um, there are some you know, physical limitations that you're dealing with, um, things like the interaction with surfaces and carryover in, in pumped fluidics. But we've, we've been through that enough times now that we've, uh, we've minimized the effects of those, of those things. Um, in terms of the device uh, optimization, um, again, an awful lot of work learned from so many different deployments with uh, colleagues, some here present and, and others in, in the NERC community, um, looking at things, what, what breaks when you, when you try this? The electronics are really important, and actually we've got very, very good um, reliability now in our, uh, 
ele electronics can survive these temperature and um, pressure extremes and very robust uh, subsystems like pumps and valves uh, and the microfluidic chip itself um, has to be very robust. Has to be very well, the lid has to be very well bonded on for it to, to be able to uh, withstand the rigors of being deployed, say, in the surface of the Southern Ocean. Okay, and uh, you know, methods for making sure that's all happened. Um, we, we've got a very good quality management system, both at, at the uh, NOC and now in the, in the company. There's been 17 years of you know, testing and problem solving and 200 deployments. And that perhaps sets us apart from some of the other new entrants into the market. You know, it's just the, the number of times that this has been tested has meant there's been an awful lot of improvements. Um, I've been lucky enough to have a large team of engineers working hand in glove with uh, analytical chemists. That's been really important, um, as has been having really good engagement from environmental scientists and stakeholders throughout this development has been really important. And, you know, it's been good. Everybody's been really motivated um, to, to do this work and, you know, the teams have been fantastic. Okay, so you know, getting to some of the uh, sensors and some of the deployments. Um, so this is my, uh, he was a PhD student, then postdoc, and now is in the company, Alex Beaton. Uh, trekking around with a uh, an early version of the nutrient sensor sensors on his back. I believe this is in Peru. Here you can see a device and it's deployed with a solar panel and a, I think that's a Campbell scientific logo and a, and a modem. Uh, I, I think that's in a glacial setting. Here's um, some work with um, Bristol and with, with Liz in the past, let's make sure. Um, looking at uh, nutrient nitrate levels in uh, a couple of glacial systems. And on the right here um, was the work that we did in the macronutrient, macronutrient cycles uh, program, uh, measuring chemistry in the Avon catchment. And here, you know, there was a battery, a solar panel, and a YSI storm logger, which meant that the data was coming off live of nutrients every half an hour um, onto the internet and uh, straight into data sensors. So you know, this, this is the possibility that you can have low infrastructure, high quality data on water chemistry streaming straight into your desktop uh, with this type of apparatus. Um, here's some, some actual data. Um, so you can see here that we get these, this is a, a, a test deployment in right outside the NOC and off the pontoon. This is, um, this is phosphate. There's two months of data here. And this has been published by uh, Max Grand. Um, and you can see these, these are discrete measurements uh, matched to, in red, matched to the gray uh, sensor measurements from the, from the lab on chip. And you can see there's a, a great deal of variability that is not captured um, by the discrete samples. And actually there's quite a lot of there is actually quite a lot of noise and uncertainty with the discrete samples itself. So um, very important um, proof that the uh, is worth deploying a sensor. And you can see, you can start to see some of the trends. So you can see, um, you know, association with this drop in salinity and increase in oxygen uh, with an increase in phosphate. It was a rainfall event. Um, and so you start to see the natural system responding in high frequency. And you can see how an average value here um, would, would not have much, um, not as much value. Um, again, here you can see just showing how uh, phosphate in here in, in blue is moving up and down with the tidal signal. So again, making a, you know, if you don't get your sample acquisition time uh, to the right point in the tidal cycle, you're gonna get a very different answer and start inferring things that just aren't, aren't true. Um, and you can see here on the right, looking at the tidal variations, that you also get these modal shifts. So if you were to, to do some modeled, and this is very common, right, to do some modeled correlation between either salinity or tidal height and the nutrients, which is what most people, certainly a lot of people do, um, those, um, those relationships change over time because of things like spring blooms, different source waters, different inputs. Um, and so you have to be careful Again, another reason why it's important to, to make, make measurements and, and reduce that uncertainty. Um, so we've also done some integration with vehicles. It's a really lovely way to get data straight into uh, the digital system. Most of these vehicles will contain a, a modem of some sort. This is a 
Kongsberg um, Sea Glider um, that we've we've already demonstrated. In fact, we've had um, nitrate, phosphate, and pH sensors in the payload bay at the back of a Sea Glider making measurements for extended times. Um, it's fairly low power requirement, but because we are uh, low power, we're, we're able to do this for multi-month um, deployments. Again, we've done this over 10 sides, 10 times. There's a couple of papers. There's a Vincent uh, paper in 2018, and just out as a, um, a Burchill paper, Anthony Burchill's just released a paper with, with me on as well, um, looking at phosphate. Um, so yeah, there's those, those two papers. Um, and the nice thing about getting uh, nutrients onto a, a glider is that you can make these measurements and redirect from, from shore. Um, so, you know, desktop science is it's really there. And this is really the only way you can currently measure uh, phosphate and silicate on a glider. And actually these sensors have gone and can go on things like uh, Argo floats and surface vehicles or um, moorings or whatever you, whatever you want really. It's only, but this is the only way you can make um, phosphate and silicate measurements on a, on a glider currently. Um, here's some of the data. So you can see here um, changes over. This is time along the on this axis. And then uh, this is depth. And you can really start to see the drawdown uh, of nitrate in the surface waters as the, the, the spring bloom uh, develops there. And this is in April 2015. Um, yes, this is one. Big. We're also integrating these sensors currently onto um, sea Explorer from Alsmar and onto the Autonaut um, UK developed and produced um, autonomous surface vehicle. Okay, so um, I'm going to round off with um, you know what, what's the opportunities for partnership. You know, we've got this fantastic technology out now and uh, available, um, but what what could we do together? Well, I think I'm really interested in what I've recently learned from the webinars here and take that to the next stage, looking at the expected value of information in various applications um, and thinking about where these, where these measurements really do add value to understanding and decision making, um, uh, both in, in science and in, in other applications. Um, we are getting a lot of interest from um, aquaculture, you know, whether that's fish health, compliantry, uh, you know, regulatory compliance or, or looking at harmful algal bloom prediction, which has, as we said, has a really major effect on the economy of agriculture. Um, water industry, looking at processes and, and water quality. Um, we haven't had so much yet from agriculture, but we're just starting to see that now looking at efficiency in, in environmental uh, stewardship. So um, really keen to look at applications. So anybody who's interested in that, please, please let us know. As I said at the beginning, uh, in my research roles uh, and a little bit in the company, we'd be very keen to try and understand if there are new sensors or assays that need to be developed, um, if there's something else that you want to measure in water, water chemistry particularly, um, and then how can we get these systems better integrated with existing or future sensing network networks and data systems, really on, on theme, hopefully, from the constructing digital environment call. Um, and also integration with models. Okay, so it tends to be a little bit of a, well, it has been historically and perhaps less so now, that gap between the modeling community and the, the observationists and the operational uh, data gatherers. And uh, we see a lot of value in, in making sure that the models inform the observation strategy and that the data helps constrain uh, uncertainty in models to it, the best of its ability. And so then it does need to be that dialogue between um, observationists, technologists, and, and modelers going forward. Okay, that is my, my uh, last slide. So uh, thank you very much for listening, and I'll be very happy to take um, any questions that you might have. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Matt. That was a, a really great overview. And um, yeah, some uh, some questions coming in in the chat now. Um, so I'm going to start with a few from from Stephen. Um, he'd like to know um, a little bit more detail about the biofouling and if you could comment on the battery life when you've got an install running with one of the wireless modems. Okay. Um... So biofouling, 
uh, we you do see biofouling, um, and but what we do <clears throat> is we, or all we do is we place a filter at the front end of the sample inlet. So we generally allow the sensors to, to foul a little bit. We might put some, if that's a problem for the vehicle or the um, for the uh, way in which it's being used for other systems, we might we might put some anti-fouling coat coatings or copper onto the device. But for the instrument itself, it re really doesn't care if it's fouled unless the fouling is so heavy that it actually perturbs the chemical environment. And all we do is we stick a typically a 0.45 micron uh, syringe filter on the front end. And because this is microfluidics, the actual volume of sample that we're pulling in is very small and you don't need a large capacity filter to just pull out um, the, the stuff that would otherwise go in and clog um, your samples. There is a couple of ex exceptions where we have seen um, that the existence of a thick biofilm actually perturbs the chemistry. Um, so we did see that when we had a clear uh, filter holder in the surface ocean and obviously some respiration was happening on and it, it perturbed. You could quite clearly see that in the value of the pH that we were measuring. But by having a dark um, filter case and, and managing that a bit, bit better, we've managed to, um, I think, eliminate that kind of problem. We've seen it also once in, in nitrate measurements. And again, it's, it's just about where you place that filter in your system and how much um, sample you draw through to, to flush out any of those background effects. But usually there's enough flow in the ocean that actually the biofilm um, doesn't cause a chemical perturbation. And that 0.4 micron, 0.45 micron typically filter, um, they, they, can, they can handle filtering, you know, many, many liters of water. And typically we're taking in a total of two liters over, a, you know, several thousand measurements. So um, two to five liters. So the, the capacities are about right. Um, we did see it once uh, where the, the filter got physically blocked. Um, and that was in a very, very turbid um, river in the US when we were doing the nutrient challenge. And there's a paper coming out actually in Frontiers that goes through some of these, um, some of these issues in, in deployments that um, co, it's an industry partnership paper um, with me, both my knock and clear water roles. Um, battery life. Um, so it really depends on the system. So there are some very good micro power uh, modems out there. Um, we tend to deploy probably a bit over eggs with a fairly uh, a large battery in, in things like catchments because it's, it's cheap and you can. So we would use a, a small um, automotive battery and a small uh, you know, half meter squared or less solar cell, um, solar panel. And that's more than enough even in, in winter to, to manage running things like a storm logger and, and sensors. And actually we've hung up hung off other uh, sensors. I don't have the power consumption figures for, for the, the storm logger and all the rest of it on the tip of my tongue, but you know, when operating the sensors are typically drawing somewhere around one to two watts, depending on what they're doing. And you can put them into a sleep mode where it's significantly less than that. So if you're measuring you know, for 10 minutes every hour, getting hourly measurements from a catchment, you can really eke out even relatively small batteries. Thank you. Um, another question from Stephen, which I think also ties in one that, that Michael Steinker's put in the uh, in the chat. Um, can you talk about the in situ calibration process? So Michael's asked if the, the filter itself would affect the water chemistry by stuff going on the filter. And you've talked about that one example where we had that. Um, but uh, I wonder if the, the in-situ calibration would take into account of that. And can you tell us a little bit more about the in-situ calibration process? Right, so uh, the in-situ calibration is really for the instrument itself. And we don't currently supply the calibrant to the front end of the filter. The filter is in the environment. Um, I mean, we could do that. Um, but like I say, the, the fouling and that issue just really hasn't proven to be the case in the vast majority of um, uh, of the environments unless we do something wrong. So I think that dealing with that filter effect is, is really about good practice in where the filter is placed and, and all of those kind of things. The calibration um, happens immediately after the, the filter. So we're carrying on board standard or standards and a blank. 
Um, and we can also do things like reagent blanks. So you can just pump reagent through the optical cell. The nice thing about the, the way that the system's set up, you've got active valves, um, which route through to different areas of the pump. So you've got quite a lot of control uh, in terms of how you program the device and which fluids get measured when. But typically we will, um, we will measure a blank, which just gives us a, an idea of how much light is coming through our optical cell. Um, that will then run through um, with a reagent blank. So it's the same thing uh, with, with the reagent in, and that gives you an idea whether your reagent's going off. And then we will measure a, usually a high standard or a high and low standard to give a full calibration um, in situ. And we've got, we've got valves within the device, and they're literally just switching the inlet to our analytical system between the environment, a blank, or one or one or one or more um, standards, and those standards um, we will analyze before the deployment typically, and we recommend that they're analyzed after the deployment to see if they shift. Um, but we do include in there, you know, mild biocides to make them last as long as possible, and we've had them last, you know, over a year, depending on which standard it is. Um, and so typically, we'll put a little bit of chloroform actually into things like the nutrient. Um, uh, standards is all and most of this is described in the, the papers that come out of the NOC. The one that doesn't need the standard is the pH because the, the dye itself is self calibrated effectively once once you've um, stable enough that once you've determined the constants for that dye, you don't need a calibrant. So we don't currently carry any calibration on board and yet we get very, very good uh, long term accuracy because the dye, the dye is just so stable. Thank you. Um, so uh, a, quest a couple more technical questions, then we'll zoom out a little bit more. Um, so Matt Fry um, asks, uh, he's very interested in the expected value of the information that you can capture. Is this something you've considered in rivers? For example, how many sensors are required to capture and or enable prediction of dynamics across the system? It's the, the age old question in the digital environment sphere. I'm wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah, so I, 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 I utterly agree with um, it was, uh, Doug Hubbard, wasn't it? Uh, who was who, who gave the talk on EVI when he, he explained the curves and you get a lot of value early on. You know, measuring something is is so much better than than not measuring. Um, but if you're already measuring, then it's about constraining the uncertainty, and that's going to vary in catchment. So I, I would have thought, you know, you you get a lot of value by um, by instrumenting at key reaches and junctions, um, and then once you've done that, then I suspect it's slightly diminishing returns, but you will continue to get value. Um, spotting things like unexpected sources um, and uh, potentially sinks, although sinks tend not to be such a big deal in, in catchment systems. Um, some, in some areas, groundwater is important. So we have done some work looking at um, putting um, devices into boreholes or on, on the end of pumps, analyzing groundwater. Um, but it's, I'm afraid it's going to be a bit of an it depends answer because it depends on the characteristics of the, the catchment and the natural system. Uh, you're, you're looking at and whether really nutrients are the dominant factor um, and whether measuring nutrients gives you a better handle on that system. So in some river systems, nitrate is already high and not limiting and it's all about phosphate. And so you, you know the, the expected value of information of your nit nitrogen measurement might not be so high, but phosphate might be the, the thing. In other areas, it's nitrogen that's high and is close to the regulatory limit. And you've got to be really, really on the ball on, on, on nitrogen. So, yeah, it's going to depend. And I think that's why it's so interesting to use that um, expected value of information framework to actually try and put a number on the value of the information that you're providing and to tailor that, um, that deployment strategy to get the, uh, the data that your stakeholder is going to want. Thank you. Um... That leads us nicely on to a uh, to question from, from Edward Darling of uh, Red List Revival. Um, he's very interested in the technicalities, but he'd like to um, ask about uh, the thoughts on reaching stakeholders who are causing issues for climate, marine, life, life on land and clean water. So how do you relate the measurements that you have to the sustainable development goals? 
Yeah, I think our our t tactic so far is to be to work with with like really big players who are either able to solve problems or to um, to change their m mode of operation to cause less problems. Um, so I. I think it is challenging because there isn't always a financial incentive for them to do so. Uh, but increasingly, even some of the most resistant organisations have you know, corporate uh, responsibility policies and the like, and that can be helpful. But actually, the best the best comes from if you can save them money. Um, so I'm very uh, I'm very hopeful that um, subsequent to what's been happening in the UK around water quality, maybe there'll be a higher level of testing and enforcement. Um, which I think will be useful in achieving uh, change, uh, but for some people, it's 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 a it's a money issue. You know, for example, optimizing agriculture, there's an awful lot of loss and money loss if you do it the wrong way without without being able to measure. And so I think, uh, yeah, the expected value of that information is going to be high when you have you know potential catastrophic stock losses fines for damaging the environment and the, the ability to not put very many fish in a pond that could perhaps take more if you if you knew what the uh, water quality issues actually were rather than what you predicted. Um, I think regulation is really important. So it's been interesting to see the regulation coming in around uh, building and nitrogen. So, you know, planning permission is now tied to a very crude paper-based model of how much nitrogen a, a horse, a sheep, a person, and a bath and a shower generates. Um, and you have to then mitigate that again with a paper-based uh, model, all based on averages, um, to whether that's going to actually in your in your environment and in the location of that development solve the nitrogen problem. Um, so I think that's important regulation that's come in, but I think there's an opportunity there to do so much better in terms of seeing if those paper-based models are correct and whether it is actually resulting in, in managing nitrogen effectively in, in the catchments. So it's, it's going to be very specific to each, um, each area, I think. Um, but, but our tactic has been to really to go, go for those um, organisations that have the biggest impact one way or another. That leads us uh, quite nicely to a question from, from Ron. Um, he'd like to... Uh, hear your thoughts on sensor and model integration so you know can we can we predict conditions based on the data that you can capture yeah so i think models are getting much better at analyzing where the uncertainty is in their their own predictions um and that's a natural place uh for, for us to target a measurement campaign um but i also think that data gathering in areas of high variability is also a fairly obvious place to look to try and improve and constrain models. Um, but what, I, what is really nice is if the models can inform where, where and when are the best places to measure, to focus that, you know, you're always going to have a limited measurement effort. Um, and whether that's a OSI or, a, you know, some, simulation experiment where you look at different measurement strategies or where you just you just look at where the er error or variability is greatest um, I, I think both can be all of those things can be can be valid um, I think it's to be honest though for us it's still quite an early stages we're not having we're not having many of those good conversations with modelers trying to constrain that error so if anybody wants to get in touch about that that would be great You spoke a little bit in the talk about um, how you're uh, making sure that the data that, that goes into online streams is, you know, uh, conforms to fair protocols and so on. Can you talk a little bit more about how you've approached capturing and integrating data into kind of cloud platforms and, you know, if you've got uh, views on, on the best way to do that to ensure the data is usable to the widest possible set of users? Uh, I mean, to be honest, for, for sort of um, open access data, we, we, we still really um, go through the data centers um, and we're working with them to, to make sure that uh, the sensors are reporting all the correct metadata so that, that that comes through. And we've been working, for example, with the ODC 
um, on using things like unique identifiers. So every sensor has a, a unique identifier. And then, you know, we're in systems where actually communication costs quite a lot. So we only want to send a very small unique identifier over the wire, say, I'm here and this is who I am. That's what the sensor will, will tell the data system. And then the data system can go, ah, right. And they can look up on you know, a, a web-based or a data center held repository and then associate those measurements with the last good calibration, where that sensor has been before, what it is, what it can measure, what its interferences are and all of that kind of good stuff. Um, so that's been our tactic to date. Um, the, I mean, it's the Wild West in cloud domain. There are a few um, uh, you know, providers that are trying to come up with um, similar standards. Um, but yeah, it's, it's commercially, commercially driven. There's a lot of commercial offers there in, in cloud-based um, com computing. And so I think, again, we are in learning mode as much as other people are, but there are, you know, some customers have already set up their own cloud-based uh, repositories that they mandate that they want us to use. Um, but in science, it tends to be data, data driven into the, the data centers at the moment. But we all know that um, the data centers are on a journey of discovery like the rest of us into, into cloud computing as well. That's very positive to hear that, yeah, you're working directly with the data centers. That's, uh, yeah, I think making making the most of the, the resources that we, we already have is, is quite important for, for all of us in sensor design. I mean, the nightmare for them is that we, you know, we generate, you know, large data sets uh, and they're going to be doing this ongoing for the future and that there has to be some manual step and personnel involved. So they're, they're really working with us hard to try and make it automated ingestion of data. So all of the data flows naturally, that the metadata flows naturally and that, that's that sort of manual work and personnel involvement is, is limited to setting up the system well rather than actually manually typing in numbers. That's good to hear. Anyone interested in that side of things, do come along to our next webinar where Scott and Shannon are going to be talking about um, what they've done from a, a kind of whole system design perspective. Uh, they're in the US, so so don't have access to our data centers, but um, that will be uh, that'll be really interesting if you're interested in that side of things. A um, couple of kind of zoom out questions to, uh, to finish with. Um, wondering if you could comment first on the challenges of working in a truly cross-disciplinary team. You know, you've talked about how you have analytical chemists, you have engineers, you've worked from everyone from glaciologists to, um, you know, auto sub people. Like there's there's a lot of different languages that you've had to learn. If you could comment on that. And then also if you had any um, nuggets of advice for anyone uh, moving from academia to industry and in the spin out uh, realm, if there's anything that you've learned that you could share. Um, I'll go for the nuggets first. It's all hard work. <laughs> There's no easy ticket, right? It, it's 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 all really hard work. And do your homework and uh, and be prepared to put put the time in. I think is uh, is probably my overall. But it's a, it's a lot of fun. I mean, it's great to see things grow um, and people to grow with it and um, take on the responsibility that you once had and fantastic results to come out. I mean, I have been very lucky to work with some really fantastic people. Um, I think the key, one of the things though, is to try and give people responsibility so that they can, they can develop and, uh, and, and have ownership of, of these things. And hopefully um, my team would say, that's what, what we try and do. Um, working with lots of different people, I just really love it. I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the most interesting things about the role, and I quite like it when they start talking a different language that I can't understand and have to do a bit of homework. And um, I think it, it's understanding that there are those differences and there's no better or worse. Um, but I quite like the common language of mathematics and of uncertainty um, and of, you know, science, um, which despite the different disciplines we, we all share. So I think it, sometimes it's, it's great to go back to fundamentals with, with people. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm very, um, despite my interest in chemistry and analytics and science, I'm, I'm quite per person focused. I think that's really important in dealing with both large inter interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary teams 
and we're talking to stakeholders. You've got to see what's motivating uh, people for multiple aspects. 